Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors and the very best one. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Vallow. And I'm Trudy J. Hello. Are you sure you're Trudy J because you weren't sure for a second there. I know, I was <laughs> kind of not sure who I was going to say. Yes. Today I'm going to be Trudy. Yay. Today and today I'm we are joined oh. by <laughs> our good friend Nalini Singh, Yay. Yay. Nalini, who is used to our chaotic madness. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. and, she, and she doesn't mind. <laughs> no, Much. no, I love it. <laughs> so I'm so, part of the so, chaos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So today Nalini is going to talk to us about world building, um, which is awesome. I'm excited. I can't wait mm. to hear everything she has to say. I'm going to be taking copious notes. Um, but for first of all, I'm going to read your bio, Nalini, and tell people how awesome you are. Um, and then we'll get into it. So Nalini Singh is an internationally best-selling author of paranormal romance, thriller, and contemporary romance. 33 of Nalini's titles have hit the New York Times bestseller list. Oh, my God, just clap. Yeah. yeah. Um, and her books have also hit the USA Today, Publishers Weekly, and Wall Street Journal bestseller lists. She's received an Australian Romance Readers Award several times and won two Sir Julius Vogel Awards. The first book in the Psy Changeling series, series, Slave to Sensation, was named as one of the New York, Pub- New York Public Library's 125 books from the last 125 years that ex- inspire a lifelong love of reading. And I actually think that's the most awesome yeah. of everything, right? Yeah, like, that's a very so cool. Absolutely. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. Um, born in Fiji and raised in New Zealand, Nalini was first published in 2003. Um, so quick note. There's a, there's a celebration that you've got going on this month, Nalini. Yes, that we need yes. To talk this about. is the 20 years since I was, uh, since I sold my first book. 20 years. Yay! 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 <laughs> that's awesome. Congratulations. That's that's great. And she's so still like in 2002, crazy. obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, her books are worth, oh, sorry. Her books are both traditionally and indie published and have sold over 8 million copies worldwide with translations in multiple languages. So wow. that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, yeah. So before we start talking about the world building, let's um, do, so you've actually been on the podcast before. It's episode 119, if anyone wants to look it up. It was back in 2018. So before you know what, back in the day. <laughs> yeah. um, in the, back in the days. before times. <laughs> in the before times. In the before times. Um, so we kind of talked a lot through a lot of your backstory and how you got into um, writing and everything in that episode. So if anyone wants to hear all of that, go back to that episode. So today we're just going to sort of do a, a, a recap maybe on what you've been doing for the last couple of years. But also um, I just want to um, get a sense of your like how many books do you write in a year? How long are your books generally? And and are you a plotter or a pantser? Those are my two questions. Go. Go. Okay. <laughs> in a list. Okay. Um, so I fluctuate between three and four books a year. Uh, I have pushed it a little bit some years just because I wanted to do something extra. But probably that's my comfort zone, three or four. Um, and that's um, somewhat because of the length of the books because they tend to be as a rule they will be a hundred thousand um and the one i just turned in is like it was 125 and so it was like mostly dead after finishing that one (laughs) (laughs) um and a lot of it it is also because very relevant to what we're going to talk about is the world building so there's a lot of complexity Mm. um in terms of all the continuity and stuff and also it's just my writing pace that's yeah what I like to do that's my pace and um I like to have time now like when I was younger you guys have known me for a very long time so I I used to be much more sort of work every weekend and work all the time basically and now I'm like well no it's actually nice to have a weekend and (laughs) relax and have that time so um in terms of plotter or panther I think I fall somewhere in between Mm -hmm. I tend I tend to have I have a very good concept of my overall series plan. And then for each book, I have a sort of vague idea where it's going. I've thought it out. I don't plot anything out on paper. I just sit down and go. And that first draft is me writing myself 
into the book. So that's how I learned the story. I'm basically telling myself the story and figuring things out. So because of this, it means I do a massive number of drafts because that mm -hmm. first draft is like the skeleton and then I go over it and over it and clothing the skeleton until it's a person or a book person. <laughs> Makes sense. Little book yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that phrase, clothing the skeleton. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I want you all to note that how I asked you three questions, and with her mind like a steel trap, she answered all three of them yeah. without yeah. having to write anything yeah. down or take notes. <laughs> That's we know she's like awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. How long will that skeleton be, um, Nalini? What's that? You mean the first draft? Yeah. yeah. Um, so say a book's going to be 100,000 words roughly, it'll uh, probably do at least 70, 70,000 wow. words wow. on the skeleton. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's a lot of material, obviously, that does get deleted mm -hmm. um, as I go into new drafts because I'm writing new material as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never thought of it as a waste because it is getting me to the point where I need to go. So mm -hmm. it's... Um, it's all part of the process and I do you you reuse a lot of the deleted material like in my newsletter or, um mm. extras for my website things like that you know fun little mm. things but um yeah yeah so roughly 70 makes me feel like comfortable <laughs> that I've got enough there's enough of the story now that I know mm. it'll make a strong book mm. and um under that I'll feel like no I haven't gone deep enough it's it's mm -hmm. too shallow at this yeah. point so it needs a lot more digging um to find out you know that that material yeah mm, that's interesting okay wow it's a cool process it is it is and it's really um really important i think to know what your process is mm. it is i think yeah. when i first started like when i joined um like romance writers of new zealand that was the first time i met other writers right and i and i heard about other processes and i saw people were doing plans and they mm. seemed so much more efficient they were mm. writing these plans out and they were getting their books done and I thought I should do that, you know. Oh my I, lord, I, you sound like me. Yeah, <laughs> I, thought, I should do that. And so I, I, I planned this book out. This, this book, I completely planned it out. And I thought, well, it's going to take me a month to write now because I've planned. I never wrote that book. Mm. I'm completely <laughs> bored. I just yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah. Oh my god! Like I know it's the story like already. Yeah. 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 What's the point? <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I I love it. I'm like kind of, oh no, now I get to dig deeper and yeah. figure out more. Oh. Anyway, that's so classic. Okay, so, um, well then, if, okay, so if you're not planning anything and writing it down, how on earth do you world build? Like, honestly, we start from the beginning. How does that work? Okay, so it depends. So obviously if you're starting a series, um, if I'm starting, a, it's all in my head. Like the entire world is in my head. That's that's how I function. Um, I don't mean like I'll sketch out a map, for example. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'll use an example of a world building example, which you wouldn't necessarily think of immediately. So I write thrillers, right? And you don't necessarily think of world building when you think of thrillers. But if I set my thriller in a small town that I've made up, I'm creating that world of that mm -hmm. small town. So what I'm doing is I'm writing it and I'm sketching out a map of where the church is, where the fire station is, where somebody lives, so that when I write the book, I know which streets they have to go into. I know what you can see from the fire station to, you know, across the road, what's over there. So I'm doing that kind of thing that mm. as I go along, I'm making those notes of things I need to know um, sort of overall for the book, but I'm not doing it ahead of time because I'm the kind of world builder who builds as I go, especially for the first book. And, um, but then after that, I have to make notes on what I've built mm -hmm. because that means maintaining continuity. Mm -hmm. So that's the person, like if you watch a TV show, if someone has a pen in one scene in their pocket, they've got to have a pen in the next scene. And there's a person whose job it is to make sure there's, a mm -hmm. pen in their pocket, right? So mm -hmm. I have to be the person, like whatever I've said okay. in book one has to carry through to book two. Mm -hmm. So the note taking happens post book because I need to make details, notes of what the reader knows, mm -hmm. what I've told the reader in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I might have something in my head where I think, oh, this is in the book. But when I go back and check, it's actually not in the book because I mm -hmm. just have it in my head. Right. So 
there's like it's kind of like being fair to the reader as well like I'm not bringing things out of nowhere that I haven't mm. given them a heads up on um in terms of world building yeah. that's something I find really hard actually like I'm always doing that it's like oh no it's this thing and then I look in the book and realize I never actually said it in the book <laughs> it's just something I knew yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. backstory yeah mm. okay but I also think Oh, sorry, there you go. No, say, sometimes it can be really funny because um, so I read a series with angels, right? And after the first book came out, I got all these emails going, "How do your angels take off their shirts?" Oh. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, you know, I had it that you know they have like they have wing slits in their clothes and like you know claps and it it was all very logical. I never put that in the book, so mm -hmm. so things like that do happen. So nobody is perfect in their yeah, world building yeah. but I think we we have to try to do our best to sort of think about those things and answer those questions yeah mm -hmm. and you learn as time goes on yes. don't you what, yeah. what, what, yeah. what is glaringly obvious and there will always day. be that one reader oh yeah <laughs> you know you just want to say them it's fiction you know just make it up think about it you know like <laughs> but there's always that reader that but like also wants people, to know and good on them yeah and some people are very literal yeah. like they want to understand exactly mm. but i also yeah. just just yeah. dialing back right to the kind of the 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 term world building i think it's interesting because for me immediately world building you think of kind of science fiction or fantasy or paranormal you know sort of alternate realities but like you said in the thriller you're writing a a, a real world like it, it exists in the you know the yeah. wilds of the west coast of New Zealand kind of thing and it's it's um but it's fictional it's a fictional world mm. and I think it hadn't actually it hadn't actually occurred to me before <laughs> you know mm. that yeah, I, mean, that's, I, I really like to use those kind of examples when I teach a workshop on world building because I think people get hung up on the fact that they think it's only speculative fiction mm. but if yeah. you think about it so I know Several of you write contemporary romances, right? But the tone of your contemporary romance world is going to be dependent on the kind of story you're writing. So, for example, um, Cheryl, I'll, I'll take your cozies as an example, right? Your cozy mysteries have a very particular tone, right? You have your, there's a side of war warmth to it and, and you're not looking at so much the dark side of life, even yeah. though you're writing mysteries. Exactly. <laughs> When I write thrillers, I'm looking at the very much the dark side. I could set my book in the same place as yours, mm -hmm. but it would be a very different tone because mm -hmm. of what I'm focusing on. And you see this in historicals as well. So, for example, you compare Jane Austen's historicals to um, oh, who was the lady that wrote North and South? Uh, the beautiful Richard oh, Armitage. Yeah. Um, um, it's oh just gosh, gone I out of my that. head. But yeah, same. If you look at the things they focus on, and, and so she, in her world, the North and South one, it's factories and, and you know, smoke and, mm. like, dust and, like, a very hard environment, whereas Jane Austen is this genteel, mm. Flowers. you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, and it's it's what we choose to show and what we choose not to show. Whatever, Elizabeth Gaskell. Yeah. Ex sure Elizabeth Gaskell, yeah, exactly. So... In contemporary and historical, any time period that you're writing in, any kind of book you're writing in, one of the one of the critical things is what do we choose to show and what do we choose not to show? Mm -hmm. That's building a world yeah. with the choices yeah. you make as a writer. Is that almost like your theme, like your theme or your tone? Like if your theme is gritty reality of life in in this re this period of time versus, you know, light-hearted romp through. Although she was making political and social statements, Jane Austen, she was, but yeah, yeah. you know, like a more a different, yes. you know, like yeah, maybe, yeah, exactly. If um, so, not every writer thinks in sort of those wide thematic terms, but if you are a writer that thinks in wide thematic terms, absolutely. If you say, um, like you said, you know, say I'm writing, I write a very light-hearted contemporary series, and in that series, you know, you're not seeing sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, I mean, there is sex, but you know what yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also have written a, a sort of a gritty rock and roll type series and in that where you're seeing the drugs and the darkness and the the terrible things that can happen to people whereas the other series is more family oriented it's warm and yeah. just all the choices I make as a writer throughout the book um, contribute to that feeling and and 
you're right. It is thematic and it is building a world based on the emotions I want the book to evoke. Mm. Um, yeah. Is that something you know before you start? Like, did you you go, okay, this one, this rock and roll story is going to be, or, you know, it, it's going to be gritty and this one's not? Like, what? what um, that's more, that's, that, that's um, part of my um, writing process as I, as I go, particularly in the first book. Um, so after I've written the first book, there the, the world has a tone already mm. right so, so it I'm based like... on whether you're feeling grumpy at the time feeling... <laughs> <laughs> if you want to kill somebody or not <laughs> <laughs> no, it, um, I tend to just leave gaps in the book saying oh something blows up here you know yeah, like, yeah. don't write it when the mood is on me no but it depends on the story it's the characters and um and you know if I'm really not in the mood to write something let's say I'm not in the mood to write something dark I'll just work on something else for, mm -hmm. for that period and then go back to my um, dark story. You when... write very different stuff too, don't yes, you? Yes, you know, I like write very, very different. very different. So yeah. it's a huge mindset shift from one to the other, isn't it? It's actually good because mm. it means I can I can keep things separate mm. quite well, like there's no bleed over, yeah. um, which is really nice because I think um, it would actually be harder to write something very similar to, and stop them from kind of becoming too similar yeah um if yeah. you know what i mean yeah, yeah so this way there's a hard demarcation and it's like yeah. well yeah. this is what it is and this is what it is and yeah. never the twain shall meet so. yeah because it's fan awesome. crossover sorry share fan crossover would be quite reader crossover would you wouldn't have any would you yeah. um i do it's not uh, it depends on so my two my paranormal series yeah. and my sort of urban fantasy romance series mm. So there's a lot of crossover in that one because it's speculative fiction and uh there's then into my contemporary there's less of a crossover but there's mm -hmm. still a crossover because it's romance yeah into my thrillers which are non-romantic there is much less crossover so a mm -hmm. lot of people have tried them because you know they they know me as an author mm -hmm. um but i was very open to to my readers from the start that this is not a romance the thrillers are not romances you know they're just yeah. standalone thrillers mm -hmm. and um so that's that's finding a new audience for me mm -hmm. that's yeah yeah mm -hmm. well yeah. i just wanted to ask you um because i think we know you as very much a linear writer and, you, and you're writing from the start to the end but you were just talking about how you would um, write something different if you weren't in that frame of mind do you mean that you would write um, um out of sequence for that particular moment and does that reflect um um when you're writing a book in a series that you wouldn't go into another series to have a to have a break i know they're two different um, things but i think i fooled you <laughs> she doesn't write linear, she doesn't yeah, write no. linear. Yeah. No. <laughs> you did you did fool me <laughs> yeah i did no i i there's one series one set of books i do write linear which is the um thrillers funnily enough because mm -hmm. i need to for whatever reason, my brain says I need to write this in a more linear fashion so I can set right. up things as, mm. as I go. Um, but a lot of my other work, um, I do jump around a bit. Mm. But I have to say, in the last few years, I find I do write a little bit more linear. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think that's just, as a writer, you just change and develop. and yeah. um, But I'm totally, like, if I'm stuck on something, I'll just... I'll just move on and if I've got another scene in my head I'll write the other scene because I don't want to be sitting at this computer staring at a screen for no. an hour when I could be writing a scene a different mm -hmm. scene for an hour mm -hmm. so um the only time I don't do that is when I know I've done a mistake somewhere and it's just completely going off the rails mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've learned this because one time I wrote like I don't know 80,000 words and I realized I made a mistake right at page one <gasps> so I, I started again like I started again it, it was a great book in the end but there's yeah. still 8,000 words out there that I didn't <laughs> oh my gosh so, so do you work on more than one project at a time um I do sometimes mm -hmm. um because um particularly when I'm playing with stuff I'll do mm. it in the background so I'll have my work project that I'm contracted on or that I've put a um, release date on um mm -hmm. if it's one of my own things um and um and then in the background as my second project i'll work on my my other thing that i'm working on mm -hmm. and if i do that it's usually something very very different 
to yeah. again keep yeah. things both it fresh for my brain like yeah. if I'm working on a contemporary romance I don't want to be working on another contemporary romance it's too close mm -hmm. so if I'm working on a contemporary romance I'm working on a thriller mm -hmm. as my second project mm -hmm. and um yeah uh I, and I also do it if I've taken on a little bit of extra work for whatever reason like I just wanted to do a novella or someone invited me to be in an anthology and I really wanted to do it but it's kind of hard to fit in I'll try and do it like that by working on a second project for a couple hours mm -hmm. in a day yeah yeah okay so, so I feel like we've gotten off track from the whole world building <laughs> uh, topic <laughs> of, the, of the show yeah. <laughs> so this was Nalini's world uh, kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's fascinating I'm not it saying is. it's not um so if we're going back to the world building, so you do it as you go. What what kind of things do you consider that are part of the world building? Is it just the setting, or is it the characters? Like, how do you, and and how do you decide? You start. Yeah, yeah, like we, you know, how does it evolve? Uh, okay, so let's say I'm gonna take the example of um. There's certain things I have to know beforehand, right? Like. I'll take my Psy Changeling series, which is, um, for those that don't know, it's a series set in the near future. So 2079, it begins. And it's a world that has uh, Psy, who have like psychic abilities, like telepathy and telekinesis and things like that. But the changelings were shapeshifters. And then we have the humans. And there's a sort of a, a divide because, between all three races because the Psy chose to live without emotion for hundred years so they completely separated themselves from the world I mean they interact but it's all very cold and business-like and so to begin that series um it began with the idea which is what wouldn't it be cool to have psychic abilities like true psychic abilities like I could teleport over to Wendy's house if I wanted right and then the next question was well what's the cost of that what what what's the cost to you of having those abilities and I thought well what if it drives you insane right like you hear all these voices and you've got all this power but the pressure on your brain is such that it you know drives you insane and so that's a foundational fact of this world and I needed to know that fact for the entire idea to even mm. begin to take place right so this is what began the series and so and then what I also needed to know is who lives in this world with the Psy um, that are losing their minds. And then um, it's hard for me to to sort of break it down because when I write, I'm actually quite obsessive and I just go in there and I'm just like, you know, <laughs> like, I, I'm yeah. not having these rational thoughts about what I'm doing. Yeah. But um, I think the changelings just came along because they're such a contrast to the Psy. Mm -hmm. They are very... Um, they're very tactile. They're very emotional. They're, they're very family centered. Bonds are everything to them. And then the humans just appeared because you need someone in between these two massive powerhouses. And then these pure humans are just, these poor humans just stuck in between, you know? <laughs> the fodder, the fodder in the middle in between. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically yeah. needed those three pillars of the world to begin because a world is is structured around the people because we change our environment right like mm. whoever lives in a world changes the environment and that's critical to think about who is living in your world if you're building a world so for example um i did a um a talk recently with the writing team of kit brocha and we talked about and they said you know um your shapeshifters uh your side changing world is the one of the only worlds where ecological things are mentioned um like there's eco showers and there's mm. you know water is collected kind of thing and to me that makes logical sense because if you're a shapeshifter and you live in a forest you're going to care about that forest right mm. and i made the point then that if animals could vote in our world would we have the kind of extinction type events we have would we mm. have the loss of habitat we wouldn't and mm. so in a world where shapeshifters hold a lot of power these things are going to matter mm. right they mm. are going mm. to make changes mm. so they have created things that are used by the other races as well because mm. it makes logical sense mm -hmm. in this world they've created this fantastic device to whatever save power or, um of course the humans on the side are also going to use it because 
but it makes sense because these are shapeshifters that mm. they have shaped the environment um, yeah. to be beneficial to them. Um, in the same way, the Sai have shaped the environment. They live in these sleek high rises with very little tactile comfort. Um, it's very icy and cold because that is the environment that supports their need to be emotionless, mm -hmm. right? And so these the it's really important to think about these things. And for example, in my world, which has angels, when they live in high rises, they have balconies, right? Those balconies don't have railings unless there's a human or a vampire yeah, living course. there as well. Because why would an angel need a railing? They just yeah, want to yeah, walk off their just, balcony. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. Right? Yeah. These are just right. like, this is why you need to consider who is living in your world before you start building this amazing world. Mm. Because you could build this brilliant world, which would, say you build a brilliant world, everything's on the first level, it's all flat, and then you decide winged beings are going to live there. Winged beings don't want to live flat on the earth. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's quite a lot to take in. Yeah. When you're saying it, it makes so much total sense. Yes. But as a reader, you just kind of it, it all flows, yeah. and that's probably yeah. why it flows, and also why people get so invested in the series mm. because at the back of our brains, it's making sense to yeah. us, yeah. but we don't kind of know why. You know, yeah. <laughs> so. exactly. I mean, that is that is the goal of good world building is yeah. that it's believable, and I sort of absorbed this lesson as a teenager when I was reading Anne McCaffrey's books mm -hmm. um so she writes um wrote the dragon riders of Pern and it's a really immersive series and it stands so well to this day and when I was reading it I was just absorbed I, yeah. I believed these dragon riders existed I believed where they lived I believed in their dragons because she had so beautifully built it and it was only later when I was writing myself and as I got older that I realized what a good job she did of immersing yeah. me mm -hmm. in that world. And that's, that's or should always be the goal of world building, whether you're doing it in a contemporary or you're doing it in a historical or you're doing it in speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. The goal is for the reader not to be kicked out of the world yeah. because something doesn't feel right. Yeah. Everything yeah. can feel, you know, even if you're writing, say you're writing a dark and gritty romance right really like sort of intense and then suddenly you have I don't know happy puppies and <laughs> you know butterflies and, and things butterflies yourself, and, no you know? puppies in dark romance <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, if you have a puppy you know it has to serve a purpose yeah what does it show does it show that the character of the dark hero is actually he's actually got a little bit of softness in him mm -hmm. that, that you you know this puppy is showing um, or is it just a happy gimbaling puppy and everyone's yeah. laughing and it's all very light and fluffy and but you've lost you've lost the the tone of your book mm, which we yeah. mentioned before yeah. so it's just each time you write a scene or each time in my case I edit a scene that I've written I'm thinking about what does this add to the world I mean what is it is it is it in line with what I've said before is it maintaining the faith with the reader in terms of the world I've built. Um, yeah, so these are things I want to make the point that a writer shouldn't sort of tie themselves in knots thinking about this at the drafting stage. This is really something at the editing stage, the questions. So even if you're the kind of writer who writes, you know, writes a chapter and then edits that chapter and it's clean and then you go on to the next one, you know, when you're doing the edit, the clean edit, that's when you think about it, because I think when people try and think about it too much in advance, that's when they get stuck mm. because they think, oh, how can I come up with all the stuff? How can I make all the answers? And um, if you give yourself permission to be wrong, you know, in that initial writing, that's OK. You know, that mm. gives you a lot of freedom. And the other thing is, particularly when you're writing the first book in a world, again, whatever that world is, you can fix anything. So if you get to chapter 20 and you realize you screwed up in chapter two and, and did something that's not going to work with your world, you can fix it. Mm. So you, that first book, you know, you got all this freedom. Yeah. It's after that that you start to be like, okay, okay, I said this thing in chapter 21 of book <laughs> one and oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. stuck now. Then you have to figure it out. 
out a way around it a work yes. around yeah. mm-hmm. and that actually me leads to some of the best books mm-hmm. because you have to come up with a really good solution you really have to think about it mm-hmm. because one of the other things and this is particularly in a long series um is if you give yourself a real problem in your world building right so for example in my psi world the psi are all connected by this neural network if they drop out of it they die okay this is this is a rule they will die like in seconds that's it there is no easy out but to be in that neural network means being controlled you know by the powers that be that have declared that they should be emotionless so how do you leave without leaving you know like how do you leave if you are literally your life depends on this network and so that's actually a source of tension throughout the series yeah because it wow. is it is set in stone yeah. and so um i don't think don't make it don't make it easy for yourself it's fun to write <laughs> more interesting books yeah. if you give yourself a problem and for a reader it's fun to read books where it's okay, how are they going to sort it out? You know, how, yeah. what is the solution to this problem? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. That is so cool. Man, I've been, my brain's now whirling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you're talking about like Anne McCaffrey because I grew up reading Anne McCaffrey too and I love her books. And I, when I think of her, I think of her amazing characters. Like that's why I love them. But actually what you're talking about is the world underneath those characters mm. that supporting yeah. them actually makes complete sense in, the, in that context too. And that's, yeah. so now I feel the need to go and reread all of Anne McCaffrey's books, um, mm-hmm. force myself to go back to the author that I love um, and reread yeah. them all just to kind of look for that world building stuff that she's doing without yeah. almost me being aware of it. That's quite fascinating. Exactly. That's yeah. the thing. You're not aware of it. That's mm. the best kind of world building yeah. when you're yeah. not aware of it. You're yeah. just, yeah. It's like ice skating, right? Like ice skating yeah. is actually really, really hard, but we all sit there watching the Olympic ice skating people going, oh, I could probably do that. Oh, yeah. they're making a bit of a funny loop. No, I've never thought that. I've never thought that in my life. Well, but it does. It's one of those things where they make it look easy. So as yeah. authors, we're, we're trying to make this yeah. not seem yeah. like the world Jarring, is, yeah. is yeah. not a uh, something that we can see the effort going into it as readers. But as a writer, mm-hmm. it's something we really, really need to be paying attention to. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that sort of brings up is what you put in, right? And so as writers, quite often we overwrite we and this can happen in world building as well so you might get fascinated by some particular part of your world that you just think is amazing and you just describe it over the top and um i remember years ago there was a um at a rwnz conference there was an author and she talked about a thumb operation she she had a thumb operation in her book because her her um, hero was like a surgeon and she got so fascinated by this topic that she just did all this research on thumb operations and then she put it in the book. And no and one enjoyed it. it. Basically just redlined all of it and left <laughs> like two lines yeah. in the book because a reader doesn't read this book to learn about a thumb no. operation. No. Right? No. Yeah. So um, that can, you know, that's a world building thing, right? Um, yeah. So she needed for, for her hero, um, you know, to to build his character as a, a surgeon, um, you just needed to know that he could do a thumb operation, a really complex one, whatever. It's like, it's like that author, Jean Ull, who wrote Cat yes. Plan of the Cave Bear. Yeah. I, wish, I wish an editor had gone through and read <laughs> all of her extensive descriptions yeah. of the tundra because um, mm. it wasn't there for that. No. <laughs> no. I wasn't obsessed with those books when I was a teenager. I have to Same. Yeah. 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 Me too. And then I the full one, Daryl Hannah ruined it all for me. Yes, <laughs> totally ruined it. Totally ruined it. Anyway. But so so what else do you do in terms of world building? Are you thinking of so we're talking we've talked about like angels with wings, where would they go? What about are there other senses that we think of that you think about? Like are you thinking about the sights and the smells and the touch and the yeah, so how does yes, it all work? Absolutely. So again, it's going to be related to who your characters are, right? Mm. So for example, um so I just finished writing a citation book, so it's very, you know, at the top of my head. So I'll use that as an example. What do you do if the person you have the hearts for can actually scent your 
the changes in your body, right? Awkward, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> like, so you might have like the secret hots for someone, but he's all like, oh. Well, I've got a really great sense of smell over here because I'm a yeah. shapeshifter. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> you need a, a suit, obviously, that shuts everything in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's like it can lead to some really fun scenes, you know, because yeah. you're like, it, it's the awareness, but it's also like, so I, I just wrote a bear hero, and one random fact is a bear's sense of smell is like seven times better than a bloodhound. Oh, wow. Did you know that? No. No. I know that. You. We know that now. <laughs> did you tell people in the book? I did actually because yeah. he makes a joke about it. You know, uh, like, like yeah. um, but um the thing is then you think about, okay, if your sense of smell is that good, are you actually just going to be smelling everything? You can't. You can't function no. like that because it would be overwhelming. So obviously they have a way to just fade out certain smells. And so they have to focus on what they want to smell as opposed to being overwhelmed this is the same as telepaths you know hearing everything versus mm. blocking out most of it and only hearing what they want to hear yeah. and so um so when you think about those kind of things you can play with it again you can use it um and um so that's the sense of smell that comes directly from a character right mm. but Say you're writing a contemporary world. Um, another thing you can look at is weather, because weather has a great effect on how you build a world. Mm. Um, for example, um, my most recent contemporary I wrote, it's actually very light. It's it's joyful. It's young. Um, and in that book, it snows, right? And they're trapped inside this apartment in the snow. And mm. it's cute because the snow is beautiful and it's made yeah. everything white and shiny. Um, Whereas if I'm doing snow in a thriller, the snow is dark, it's yeah. cold, mm. it's really hard to walk through, it's dangerous because you're stuck outside. So you're using weather to mm. impart a tone into your book. And it's you're not you're not limited by so you for example, it can't only rain in dark books. It can rain mm. in in a happy book. And then mm. you have people out in their gumboots dancing in the rain, you know? Mm. Um yeah. or you know, you have them you know, that moment in many a movie where the hero and the heroine are sort of under yeah. an umbrella with the rain mm. coming out kind mm. of thing. So um, weather is like really important. And I think it's actually something a lot of people forget. Yeah. When they build worlds, so we true. just yeah. assume, we just assume the weather. Yeah. yeah. But if you'd spend a little bit of time and you just weave weather into it. Yeah. This adds so much depth to a story, you know, it's really critical. Mm. Um. And again, like uh, I think uh, Trudy mentioned tactile things. That's really important too, right? So for example, if say I'm going to someone's house and there's a scene, I'm going to visit the love of my life. So I'm going to visit the grandma who is the most important thing person in their world, right? I'm sitting on their couch and I don't know, it's really stiff brocade and it's kind of just starting to itch on yeah. where I've got my arm or something and then so where you take that is where you want the scene to go like is it a happy scene or a funny scene or a dark mm. scene you know you 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 use just those little elements to either add add an irritation mm. or add comfort mm. right yeah. so you go into grandma's house and the couch is all kind of soft and um cozy and it's got signs of being loved yeah and you kind of sink into it you know mm. um i have a number of scenes in one of my books where these two best friends you know they they sit on a couch at the top of an apartment building in new york um because one of them has wings you know is an angel mm. and so there's this old ready old couch and they sit there with their cups of tea or mugs coffee or drinks or whatever and they just watch new york around them and it's it's fun you know it's, yeah. it's a it's what two friends would do you know it's, yeah. it's not a yeah. And again, it, it adds an element without heavy world building, without yeah. heavy handedness. It's yeah. just, you wouldn't sit in a fancy couch at the top of no. a building in New York. You know, it's going to be a ready couch that's out there in the elements and you just kind of crash on it when your friend flies over yeah. for a visit. 
because she can't get through the doors because of the size of her wings, okay? So again, <laughs> but there's no railing, so she can yeah. just fly in. But she can fly in. So these are the things you think about. So, for example, her father hasn't extended his doorways so his daughter can walk through with wings, mm -hmm. whereas her friend has. So right. these are these details that add emotional depth to the story with a structural element, like mm -hmm. the literal building is adding emotion yeah. to the story. Because yeah, instantly we like the friend, but we don't like the father. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing way. Instead of saying that my father hates me, yeah. Yeah. he mm. hasn't created the building, the, mm. the door sizes that make allow it to fit in. Mm. That's a genius way to actually say the, mm. or what, I mean, maybe he doesn't hate her, but, you know, he's disappointed. Yeah. Or he's yeah. got an issue with her. But there's, yeah. Mm. So saying you can stuff say without so having to much. say much. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Say so much using the surroundings mm. um, and the elements. And um, I just wrote a book where um, Hera, who is who is Sai, ends up with a changeling. And they end up in her pack. And when they go there, so she's a cat, so she can climb really well, right? Her eyrie at the cabin is built way off the ground in the tree. But then, the, then you see that they've left this rope ladder out for him to climb mm, up. Yeah. So that's a, that's a sign of welcome. Mm. Right? You are welcome to the space. We're inviting mm. you. So again, you're using an element of the environment mm -hmm. to show something else altogether. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these are the kind of things again you think of in edits. You think yeah. of what does what does this thing I've created this this structure I've created what does it say. And sometimes it's just a building, right? Yeah. So yeah. you don't, again, tie yourself in knots about everything. Sometimes people just walk into the bank and it's yeah. a bank. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Um, but when you have those deep emotional moments or the scenes, then you think about all the elements within that scene mm. that could add to to the world you've created. Yeah. Mm. So, do you yeah. see all this in your head? Are you a visual, like, if you close your eyes, can you do you see it as a movie or as a picture? Yes. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's a movie running in my head. Yeah. Mm. So you, you mentioned emotional connection then, and I think that's an interesting concept. Do you think world building is essentially adding to that emotional depth? Is that its purpose or is it, what is the purpose of kind of creating the world around? Um, so it can have multiple purposes. The first is um, just that it is a space in which the story takes place, right? It is, the aim of a world is to create um, it's a vivid and realistic creation of the space for your story to take place in. Mm -hmm. um, whether that is, a, you know, a cabin in the woods or an apartment in the city. Or, for example, if you're writing about a sports team, it is a world of elite sports players, maybe. You know, this is the world they inhabit. Mm -hmm. So it's, first of all, it's making it feel real. That is its first job. But when you take it to the next level, it is to add to the emotional impact of the story because um, our environment is so much a part of our lives, right? Every day. For example, let's look at where you guys are filming in your offices, um, most of you. Um, I can see um, pictures of your books behind you for a couple of you. And, oh, yep, there's Trudy's as well and there's books in the shelf. And um, and so immediately I know these are important to you. And I can see flowers um, behind Sha. And so it's like these are things that are part of your life that make you feel happy to be in this space. Mm. And so we have to understand that our characters inhabit these spaces and these spaces have certain meanings to them. So a sports player who's work, walking into a locker room is maybe going to be, say he's happy to play a game, you know, he's excited. This is his big, big break. Whereas say an aging sports player walks into a locker room and the sense in that room, you know, this the smells you get in a locker room, you know, like sweat and socks and, you know, all that stuff. He's maybe thinking, maybe he's thinking of retiring. So all he's feeling is nostalgia or he's feeling like he's sad mm. because this is the end. Whereas the same sense, you could use it like it hits him like a punch that he's in the space now. Oh, my God, he's going to go out onto the field. He's going to be 
this is his dream and the scents are just revving him up so um so that the the emotional impact of a space of a world um is like you know the critical second layer because i think that's what takes it from an okay mm -hmm. uh, book or a story to the next level because the you interaction between yes. the setting and the characters yeah. yes yeah. exactly so it's mm. not they're not dolls moving in a space mm. they live in that space mm. they inhabit it fully yeah yeah Mm. That's actually, a, that's a really good point. There's kind of like, there's the, there could be quite a um, a 2D representation of that world, which yep. maybe is in some books, but this you're talking about that next level, like actually inhabiting <clears throat> it, the characters and how they interact with it becomes yep. really important. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, so a question I have is, is how do you know, like you've created this world and you've decided on some magic system or whatever, and you've decided that the side changelings should all be purple yeah. and, um, and that they need to, I don't know, whatever. And how do you know you've gone too far? Like what, what is, is there a balance that you're looking for? Is there something that you kind of, is there a way to know that you haven't gone crazy and created this world that just isn't going to work? And what, yeah, is there something you're looking for? so first of all it depends on what you're writing right like so you say you're writing something very camp in which case you you push it you know you go to the limit because camp is about being camp by over the top right but say you're writing just a um just a romance is like a, a serious one or a funny one but you know um, it's not not meant to be camp it's not meant to be over the top it's just within its genre then what I tell people is don't change things without reason. Like you said, I decided to make everyone purple. Why? Why is everyone purple? Why is it, is it, is it because the food they eat on this planet is makes them all purple? Like mm. there needs to be a reason for like, don't the, the example I use in my um, workshops, it's ducks, right? Like if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, just call it a duck. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Doesn't need to be some weird name that is actually a duck, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, think about why. The why question is really important. Why are you putting this into your world? Is it just because you think it's funny or um, mm -hmm. amusing? That doesn't mean you can't have funny things in there. You can. You can <laughs> have the odd thing for, for flavor or for color, or, you know? But if you continuously do this, then it becomes very false. And you lose the realism, which mm. is which is what you want, mm. um, because it, the whole time people are going, "This is bonkers. Why is this even?" <laughs> it's a duck, damn it! It's a duck. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so for example, Ru Ruby Dixon series, right? The Blue Aliens. We buy that because it's literally another planet. Mm. It's cold. Mm. People are blue. It makes sense, right? Yeah. Like we we buy that. Whereas if you had said okay the story is set on earth but these people are blue <laughs> then you immediately the brain goes kind of but why yeah. why yeah. are these people blue <laughs> you know yeah. yeah so it's 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 just think about it, that moment of like why am I doing this mm. um and one thing I used to do when I was younger because I started trying to write books very young I would put all these hyphens and um, apostrophes in the names of my characters because I thought it looked cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just annoying, okay? It's After a while, it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a few apostrophe hyphen names. That's fine. That makes sense. But if you're just doing something because you think it looks cool, you, you really need to take a step back and think, is it actually cool or is it just uh, me being... Thank you, I'm cool. Inner teenager. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is it just oh, yeah. making it harder for readers to yeah. read? Is mm. it just a distraction? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, because um, yeah, exactly. That's you've put it perfectly, Trudy. Like, is what you're doing is it a distraction to readers? Mm. And anytime you do that again, you're pulling them out of this world because it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why? Why is that happening? Mm. And again, it's like a snag. You know, you mm. hit a snag, and it's like, yeah. or like the record scratches. Yeah. and read it thrown out of your world um and i'll give you a um a completely non speculative fiction example so i was reading this book years ago and i still remember it because i was so like it was like i can't believe this happened but um it's a thriller so it's this thriller and his house burns down 
And the author made a specific point of saying his wallet was in the house, so his wallet burned down with the hats, right? Okay, I'm like, okay, so his wallet's burned down. That, that's got to be a point, right? In the next chapter, he checks into a hotel. He doesn't pull out his wallet. <gasps> he pulls I... out his wallet. Oh. oh! So that is a continuity <laughs> error, right? It's, a, yeah. it's just a continuity error. Yeah. That, that's nobody has picked up. But because mm -hmm. the author had said specifically mm -hmm. that his wallet burnt down, I thought there was a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the error really stuck in my head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you need to consider what you're pointing out and why you're pointing it out. That's mm -hmm. part of world building as well. So if you point out, for example, that um, Jane Austen, again, because everybody knows that work is that um oh the 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 big house that the neighbors have is being let you know um it's so big and it's enormous it's like a mansion and everyone's very excited um because the it's important that these people have wealth it's important to the story and so yeah. it's pointed out um and she's very clever with actually putting in lots of information in dialogue um mm. Uh, it's very well done you know that the mother's like oh I heard that he has well, I can't remember how much money it was is it mm. five million a year or yeah, something? Yeah, I can't yeah. even remember. And five thousand I think five thousand pounds <laughs> a year yeah yeah like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah five thousand a year you know and it's just like it's gossip but it's information yeah. being exchanged Netherfield you know? Hall is lit again that's right Netherfield yeah. Hall I was trying to think of the name mm. and so you have to think about what are you putting the spotlight on that's mm. That's a critical part of world building. Uh, do we put a spotlight on this or do we? So, for example, if you're, um, say again, you're writing something grim and gritty, I, you're putting the spotlight on the sidewalk that's rubbish has built up along the sidewalk mm -hmm. and you think you hear a rat yep. in the rubbish bin kind of thing. Whereas you're writing something lighter, you're like, the focus is on the little flower that's growing up out of the sidewalk yeah. and um, the little kid's chalk drawing that someone's drawn on yeah. the child sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So where you shift the light, um, you're building your world by yeah. shifting the light and showing the reader the part of the world that you want to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Love and actually, nice the, putting it. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the one good way to actually, you know, if you have trouble visualizing this, if you're trying to teach yourself deeper world building is to find books set in the exact same location by different authors writing different things yeah so you will see how different a city appears in one book mm. to another compared yeah. dependent on the kind of story an author is writing mm. um so that's that's or you just watch it on tv you know mm. um sex in the city is set in new york um and what else is set in new york there's a lot of grim Friends. stuff. Friends are set in yeah. New York. It's a whole lot of crime world. shows, isn't it? A lot of crime, crime shows, shows as well. In, so the, you know, yeah, yeah it's like NYU. Yeah. NYU, no, New York. Um, yeah. So you look at you look at what they're showing you. Completely different versions of the world, mm. um, of the same place, mm. and mm. it's dependent on where the spotlight is shining. Mm. Yeah, that yeah. makes perfect sense. If, if you're a plotter, which say, for example, like me, I, I feel like scene by scene, you could kind of write it and say, what is it that I'm trying to, what emotion am I trying to evoke in this particular scene? And what world building aspects can I use to help me evoke that? Mm. Like, is that, I mean, I don't yeah. know if that's something, uh, uh, is that something you would do in editing? Is that your conscious? Yeah, I do that in editing, but you can do that if you're a plotter. Like, I mm. think for a plotter, um, like I've said, I build worlds as I go. I think for a plotter, you will need to do some building beforehand so you have enough pieces in place that you mm -hmm. feel um, comfortable mm -hmm. um, going forward. But the one um, sort of coda to that is if you are a plotter and you do build your world before you start writing or you build most of it, you have to be open to going back and fixing things mm -hmm. that come up because you didn't think of something that mm. comes up during the process mm. you have mm. to be willing to go back and maybe do a little bit more editing than you normally would um mm. if you're a plotter because i think if you're um particularly if you're doing heavy world building say you're building a whole town you're building a whole new town um and it's uh, for a contemporary series but you get to a chapter and you realize you actually need a pizzeria and you never put the pizzeria in 
the pizzeria shouldn't just appear in chapter 20. It needs to, you need to go back and weave the pizzeria in from the yeah. start so that mm -hmm. people are popping into the pizzeria or um, as you see someone with a pizza, just mm. it has to be naturally woven in. Yeah. So um, I think that's the thing with plotters. If you're doing world building and you're a plotter, mm. sure, do it before you start, yeah. but make notes as you go of the things you, so you might need to do another run through your book. Um, whereas normally you would just finish at the last chapter and you'd be done. Um, so yeah, just keep keep that openness. Um, mm. Yeah. So do yeah, you so do you have a series bible? Like, how do you keep all your notes organized? And well, it's the steel trap mind treaty. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was half expecting you to say, Nalini. So I was like, "Yeah, we, if she we says know that, I'm going to be very angry." <laughs> I think it's the an aspect of that. Don't you worry. Um, no, yeah, I, I have a series Bible, so um, I kept it myself for a long time. I actually learned on the fly. So the side training series was the first series I ever wrote, and so I wrote the first book. It's all on my head. That's fine. I can say whatever I want in the first book. Then I started writing the second book and I realized I had to keep referring back to the first book yeah. because there was all the stuff I needed to carry through. So um, I realized I needed to keep a Bible. So I figured out a Bible that worked for me. And in my case, um, I do it by a character. So I have like, for example, Lucas, Lucas Hunter's name at the top. And then I'd have his date of birth. I have like his parents. Then I have like location data. I have anything anything where he's cross-referenced, the information is there. Obviously I have his physical characteristics, that kind of thing. Um, and then I would have Sasha, who is the other protagonist of the book. Um, and then I would have the same for her. And I have maps um, of the areas because I've changed certain things around. Because again, this is a world where changelings, you know, shapeshifters exist. So there are, there are a lot more forests in my California than there are now. Um, and, and I want to say that this kind of thing, sometimes people used to procrastinate because I think they want to make this beautiful map. Mm -hmm. You know what? No, just print out a map off the internet if, you, if you're sitting it in a real world place and then just mark it up with what you need. It <laughs> takes like 10 minutes. You're taking all the fun out of it, Nelly. <laughs> I always say you can procrastinate after your book is done. Yeah. You, know, you, you can make That's pretty right. maps for your website or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but for... And like, if you're making up a little town for like a cozy mystery, say, you can scribble up a little map of your town on a piece of paper and you can make a pretty map for your website or for your book, for your inside of your book, if you want, yeah. later after the book mm -hmm. is done. So don't use it to procrastinate. And yeah. the other tip I had hidden in there is um, give your characters birth dates, especially if you're doing a longer running series where um, people are going to grow. And this is very important, especially for children, because children mm -hmm. grow Visibly. no they don't it's ridiculous. yeah <laughs> yeah so children go visibly so you need to get it right because it's yeah. going to look really weird if two years have passed and your baby is still a baby you know so um so yeah I did that myself for a long time and then um so now I last time I counted there's over like two million words in the series um I think it's probably closer to three yeah. heading towards that way but there's a lot of words to keep track of myself. <laughs> so um, a lot of it is actually still in my head because like I said, I'm a visual writer and that it's a movie running in my head. So I can run the movie backwards and, you know, I can rewind and go back and, and remember certain things. But again, there's a lot of detail that needs to be correct. So now um, my sister, who is my assistant, she actually keeps a much more detailed um, uh, wiki for me, she calls it the wiki because originally we did put it online, um, a private wiki that I could reference, but I actually never looked at it because when I write, I turn off everything. I don't like yeah. to go look anywhere. I just like my folders. So now what she does is um, when I'm writing a book, I'll say I need information on this specific series um, of events or I'll need the specifics on this particular element in the series and she'll go through and she'll pull out all that information. And she'll send it to me and I'll print it out because I need to print it out. Mm -hmm. And then I have it. Um, and at the end of it, I always, always, always still reference the previous books because, again, they are the, the first source of continuity information because that is what the reader knows. Mm -hmm. 
that is what has been published. And and I'll just make this little point. I know as indie writers, it's much easier to edit your books, right? You can upload a new book. <clears throat> Please don't do this if you're writing a, con a continuity-based series like a paranormal or a science fiction or anything like that. You can't fix things by just going back and editing your book because readers have invested in the book you already put out. So if you made a boo-boo, you need to find a way to fix it within the stories. Like you can't, you can't cheat yeah. because once you do that, you kind of lose the tension because then you lose the reader's trust. Because if that happened to me, if I was into a series and the author went back and changed something, I would be like horrified. <laughs> I would be horrified. I would yeah. not trust them at all. So it's really, really important um, not to do that. You know, you have to you have to live with what you've said in a continuity based series, you know, just, just, just wear it, be proud of it, be ah, proud of own, it. Mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> own it, own it, um, but yeah, so we do, um, and I also keep timelines, every single book has a timeline, and then I have an overall timeline of the series, and this is again important in series where times are important, um, so for example, or you might be thinking, oh, my series time's not that important. But say you have a pregnancy in the series and your books are quite close together timeline, you need to figure out when that baby's going to be born mm. because mm. you can't, one time I almost made someone 11 months pregnant because I didn't check my timeline. <laughs> so <laughs> these things matter, you know, yeah. and the tiny details, say you write a, a happy contemporary series um you know everyone's getting their romance and you have a little bit of cross um you know people crossing paths and stuff if you keep track of details like that you're adding depth to your story yeah. because you you might run into a couple from a previous book and they have a two-year-old you know daughter um and then the readers are going to be really happy because it's like oh my god they had a you know, last time we saw her, she was a baby mm. and now she's two years old and it makes logical sense in the context mm. of your world. And so I always say, you know, look for these opportunities to add depth to your world with detail. Yeah. And you might think that's a minor detail, <clears throat> but we all smiled when I said that, right? We, mm. we all thought, oh, that's really cute, you know, and mm. the reader's going to smile too because they're going to be happy to see that. You know, I know I as a reader and really yeah. excited when I see, you know, like a sort of throwback to a, yeah. to a previous yeah. story. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's fun, you know, it's fun to, to have these little things come in or you have a little kid, you know, throw a ball through a window and you find out that the naughty kid is the son of the bad boy hero from three mm -hmm. books ago, you know. It's, yeah. And keeping timelines helps you with that because it's not a lot of work to say, flip back quickly and say, oh, it's been three years since that book in my story world um you know this would have happened and it it's not just people it can be things like say your couple plants a rose bush by the front door and it's really tiny they plant it and then their friends visit and it's a year later and the roses are blooming mm -hmm. and if that rose bush meant something important they planted it because in memory of someone for example yeah, yeah. um you know or as a declaration of love whatever it means something to see yeah. that rose bush thriving and blooming yeah. And you never have to say anything about their relationship. They literally don't have to appear on the page. Someone could walk past and notice that the rose bush is blooming on their front steps and your reader has gotten an update on that particular couple. Yeah. So it's it's these small details, but they add so much to a book yeah. and to the reader's experience. Definitely the reader's experience. I feel like as a reader, I'd be like, oh, I get that. I know what yeah. that means. Mm. It'd make me feel yeah. like a part of an insider kind of club. Yeah, almost. exactly. That's what I like to feel as a reader. Yeah. I got, that. You know, I got yeah. that Easter egg. Um, yeah. So it's it's just nice to have those moments that you can slip in. Mm. Um, obviously, that's not the, the main focus of the book, but just because it's not the main focus doesn't mean it's also not important yeah. to the mm -hmm. overall world you're creating with your books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I've got a practical question. So in, in terms of keeping the timeline, do you keep it like, is it a handwritten note? Is it a Word document? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it an online, you know, one of these online kind of timeliney things? Um, for me, <laughs> I'm, I'm old school. <laughs> so I did try one of the online things because I thought it might be a bit more useful for my overall series timeline. Mm. Um, but for me, just... Um, pen and paper works mm. so when I when I'm working I have a whiteboard next to me and I have like a different colored pens you know whiteboard markers and I I'll just keep it as I go and I have one color assigned to the protagonist I have another color assigned to if there's a main antagonist mm -hmm. or I have a third color assigned to um so some of my books you know have multiple points of view so they'll get a and that way, visually, I can immediately see the structure of the story when I look at it. But the other thing with using a whiteboard is because I edit so much, I can easily wipe out and fix things. And then at the end, that whiteboard information is um, copied onto a document um, in color. Um, and so I've always got that to refer back to. If I, for example, need to refer to an event from book seven in book nine, I can go back to that timeline and reference it quite specifically. Yeah. Again, that's a little thing that maybe not a lot of readers will notice, but you'd be surprised mm -hmm. yeah. how many people do notice. Um, and so that works really well for me. Just And then in terms of the overall series timeline, <clears throat> I was just saying to Ashwini the other day that I need to copy this thing somewhere because if something happened... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't say that. Don't yeah. say that. <laughs> I would just die. I was, and so like, um, I even if I take pictures of it on my yeah. phone, you know, yeah. as a, yeah. and keep scans somewhere, that that's enough. Um, yeah. but again, for me, it's about doing things in a way. I think everyone's brains functions differently, mm -hmm. but as writers, I think we need to find whatever works for us. Yeah, that's the most time efficient. Mm. And that's not procrastination because yeah. I see this a lot when people talk about world building. You know, they're making beautiful collages mm. and they're doing, oh, the things people write us find to procrastinate about, man, yeah. we could make a list. Yeah. You, could about it, right? <laughs> you could write a book about it, right? We don't like a journal. We could write a book about it. I remember there was it's quite a few years ago now and there was a very talented author her name was Jenny Cruzy and she was a, a former art teacher and she did these amazing collages but it was like 3D do you remember and she would actually collage the entire story and these mm. incredible works of art mm. and I was like that's <laughs> That's, that's a piece for me you know? and, oh my goodness it didn't look like Jenny Crazy's let's just say that but 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 for some writers it absolutely yes. worked like they could see literally the whole book in, in a in a object you know in a in a piece of art and I mean I just that blew blew my mind I mean I can admire it but yes well, it she is, after she finished the book thing. What was that, Trudy? I said, as long as she did the artwork after the book was finished, so that's fine. It's not procrastination. <laughs> it's... From memory, and I mean, we're talking a long time ago, from memory, it was a way of, it was her version of plotting. Was Yeah, she, that was her was, first draft, it was right? Her first so she draft. was still producing the work. Yeah. Mm, but, okay. um, and so that's the thing, you need to be able to produce the work. Yeah. What I call procrastination is when you don't produce the work, all you have yeah. is this beautiful world yeah. that you've yeah. built. Mm. Um, maybe you've built it with collages or you've built you've literally gotten play-doh out and your play-doh builds your world or that's a whatever. good idea that would be cool <laughs> but don't no give book. any more ideas now <laughs> <Play. laughs> yeah so just as long as whatever you're doing is is not impeding mm. your writing mm. um and i think in the worst cases if you don't know if you do know that you're a kind of writer who will procrastinate you know give yourself a time limit yeah you know mm -hmm. I, I have mm -hmm. I have an hour in the morning to do this this whatever that makes me happy to write my book to yeah. build my world yeah. and then I actually have to write mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um so yeah just um I think uh, just don't fall into things where you're gonna have beautiful things but no book at the yeah. end of it yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's actually the perfect place to end. I think it is too. <laughs> yeah, because let's face it, we have to write the book, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Oh, oh, that's, that's so awesome, Nalini. Thank you yeah. so much for, yeah. um, for talking to us. It was about amazing. I've, I've gotten heaps of out of it. Like I've, I've written pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy doesn't no, it notes. was really fun to talk to you guys, as yeah. always. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you for inviting me on your show again. That's oh, amazing. Well, welcome. Yes. If people want to um, find you, where's the best place to look? Uh, my website is uh, nalinisingh.com. Um, there is a little writer section. Um that I've linked any articles and uh, things I've done. And I actually just did an article for Writer's Digest on 10 trips, 10 tips for mm -hmm. world building. So oh, yeah. um, that cool. link should be on there. Um, if not now, it'll be on, on there with the next set of updates. But um, yeah, it's got all my social medias on there. So um, awesome. I, I'm not really on Twitter anymore, unfortunately, just, um, but Instagram and Facebook, I am more active. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can follow me on there if you like. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so and much. And Sha, where can we be found? So we can be found at spargirlspodcast.com. Um, we can be found on Instagram and Facebook as well. And we can also be found at patreon.com forward slash spargirlspodcast. And we would really appreciate your support there too. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you all to all our listeners for listening to us today. Talk to Nalini about world building. Um, that's it for now, but we'll be back again next week. See you all. Bye. 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 Bye.